thanks a lot to be here. Um, it's the first the first webinar of we hope a long series of webinars. Um, so we will be talking about greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, measuring to modeling. Um, so I will moderate uh, this, this session uh, and uh, David Yanez uh, Ruiz will present uh, some uh, something uh, during the webinar. And then uh, Agustin Del Prado will uh, give also some input and then we will have a, 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 a exchange in then uh, and questions. So yeah, we will hope we'll finish at uh, at noon. Um, so first we'll have an introduction, what is pathways, then the presentation uh, by David, then the question, and then we we want to to have your feedback about uh, the session to improve the other one. So first of all, what is pathway? So it's a European project and with the aim of reducing environmental impacts while addressing societal demands for safe, nutritious and affordable meat and dairy products. So it's a project about uh, identifying and increasing sustainable practices along the supply and production chains of the European livestock sector. So it's a right subject with a uh, lot of uh, partners all around Europe. You can see it in the map. Um, and um, one one of the goal uh, one of the one of the aim is also to to gather people to exchange about some uh, some different topics uh, related to to the work we are doing in the project, and that's why we we come to the community of practice. So the aim is to involve international and national stakeholders from different value chains and diverse organizations to stimulate exchange and debate and debates about livestock uh, in European society. So that's why you're here today. It's our first webinar. Thanks a lot to be here. Um, so we really want to bring together actors and facilitate dialogues and discussions uh, on the issue related to the project. So exchange and debate, um, the form will be online and short, like today, with participative interactive aspects and presentation by experts with various type of actors and various topics. So today is a uh, uh, green gas emission, and the next one will be more about future lives of system. Uh, we will be maybe uh, welfare or different topics. So the idea is to have four webinars or one table uh, each year. So we start today and then we will have another one mid-December. We will keep you in touch. Uh, and then in February, we want to organize a round table uh, in Brussels uh, with, uh, with you. Uh, and then three online webinars during the year. That's a plan for uh, to next year. Um, and that's it for the presentation of the community of practice. Don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions. Um, and then um, just before to start the presentation, um, we, will, we would like to know each other, to know you better, and at least have a better idea of who is here. <laughs> so if you have um, a smartphone, you can uh, you can uh, scan the, the QR code, or you can uh, you can click on the link. I will put it uh, on the conversations. And the idea is to put the sticky notes with your name, your organization, and if you work on greenhouse gas emission or not, yes or no. And uh, you will see there will be a map, and you can put the sticky notes on your country. Uh, so I will. Um, I will put the link in the chat, and I also share my screen so you can see where you are going. So you click on the on the link on the screen and it will open up on your on your browser. <laughs> that looks like this. 
Um, and the idea is to click on the plus here and to type your name. So I'm Amdine Menet from uh, Itel. And I'm not directly working on green, greenhouse gas emission from like so I put no. I will click here to send the sticky notes. Sorry, Amandine, we, we can't see the screen. Oh, what you're sorry. Doing. We, we still see the PowerPoint. Sorry, I make a new, sorry, thanks. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> so you, you arrive here, you click on the, on the plus, you, you fill the sticky note and you send it with this button. And then you can grab the sticky note and put it on your country. Is it okay? And you have um, here plus and minus button to choose button. And don't hesitate to tell me if you have a problem to access to the platform or in the in the chat or in Mac. It'll take like a few minutes to do it, just to have a an nice view of who, who are here today. Okay, so we have some pathway partners, SLU. We also have some people from University of Reading, of course, from Revolve. We have people, oh yeah, so University of Reading. Have you looked at it in Spain? Lots of people from the UK. A lot from the Northwest. Yeah. Do you will take one more minute and then uh, I will give the floor. Okay, yeah, we, we miss uh, Central Europe and, uh, and South. Oh, so we have someone from Bangladesh in the chat. So yeah, sorry, <laughs> I only put the I, I only put the map of Europe. That uh, you need a bigger map. Nice to meet you. And also someone from Australia. And someone from England also.
Okay, another one, another people from Spain. Okay. If you if you want, you can do it later or just put a message on the chat. Um, the, the board will be will stay open, so we can uh, we can see it. And if I just take a look, so obviously David work on the topic. Um, but the other people not, and yes, some people in the UK work on it, um, and other don't. Um, we seem to have a, a, a variety in the in our little community right now, so it's nice. Okay, thanks for this. Don't hesitate to to put it your sticky notes later if you want, and. David, I will let you the floor. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, and yeah. can you see my slides? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Amandine and and Stuart uh, for um, organizing the the first webinar. Um, so I'm David Janez from uh, from the Spanish Research Council. I'm based in in Granada in, in South Spain. Uh, I'm going to present, uh, uh, well, just a a general view of um, how to link measuring and modeling of greenhouse gases emissions uh, using some examples, which is a uh, Part of the work that we're doing in Pathways, uh, and I prepared this presentation together with Simon Mox from Aberystwyth University, who is also involved in in one of the work packages, uh, but he couldn't make it um, to the meeting uh, today. And we also have the privilege to have uh, Agustin Del Prado from the Basque Center of uh, Climate Change with us. Uh, he's an expert in um, in modeling the environmental impact of uh, livestock production systems, uh, and, and I'm sure he can provide a uh, uh, his own experience and feedback after the after the presentation. So thank you, Agustin, as well for agreeing to to join us. Right. So um, just to uh, to start uh, with the overall picture of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, and we can use uh, many different um, type of graphs. But uh, I like this one because. Uh, it shows uh, not only the importance of the different greenhouse gases, so carbon, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, but also where they come from uh, in terms of the different uh, economic sectors. Uh, obviously, this is a global picture. It changes from country to country. And, and I like this one because it shows that, yeah, agriculture and livestock in particular, they have um, a contribution. That contribution is uh, significant, but uh, there are other sectors that have um, equal or major contribution. So livestock is not the devil here. It's just one of the sectors that uh, uh, contribute to the emission of greenhouse gases. And as such, we need to uh, to take it and to uh, evaluate it, but not as the uh, the one to blame for, uh, for many uh, disasters. So yeah, every sector, every human activity generates carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, in particular from, from livestock mainly methane from uh, from enteric fragmentation and and manure fermentation as we will see later and also nitrous oxide from uh, fertilization of um, of a crop production there are other sources as we will see uh, later on these three gases are very different uh, in terms of the uh, warming potential uh, and, and as you know the co2 is used uh, as a as a reference and then Methane and nitrous oxide are considered um, in relation to CO2, and then they have been given, allocated a, a, a global warming potential in relation to CO2. You have the figures there, but that figure changes depending on the timeline that we use. Uh, in general, we were using a 100-year time horizon, but as you know, methane is a short-life uh, methane, a greenhouse gas, 
So uh, the impact uh, is different to nitrous oxide, which is a very much longer time uh, lifespan in the, in the atmosphere. So depending on that, we will use different uh, metrics, but also um, we need to consider uh, the relevance of different strategies because, for instance, methane is much more powerful than uh, CO2, but because it stays in the atmosphere for much shorter, any measure that we uh, implement uh, now, uh, the benefits can be seen in the medium or short term, while if we do the same with nitrous oxide, we will not see the benefits in a very long time. That doesn't mean that we only need to focus on methane, but this these uh, aspects need to be considered. Another aspect to consider is the, um, the metrics are also changing. And, and you may have heard about the GYP star, which is another uh, progress on trying to um, evaluate the impact of uh, different gas, uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So, and I will not go in, in, in explaining those here, um, but depending on the metrics that we use, the message can be very different. And, and this is something that we need to also to consider in a critical way. Right, if we if we take a dairy cattle farm uh, with land to produce feed, as you can see here, but also grazing area, uh, as an example, we can um, easily identify the different sources of greenhouse gases uh, emissions. Uh, we have on one hand uh, the inputs. Let me just change this. Uh, uh. Yeah, that's better now. Yeah, so um, we can consider different sources, as I was saying. So the first one is the um, the ones that are related to producing the feed, which can be uh, happening inside or outside the farm, and they mainly contribute with CO2 and nitrous oxide emissions. And we will see them later on. Then the Another main source is the animal physiology itself, which contributes uh, to uh, the emissions of enteric methane uh, due to the fermentation that occurs in the rumen. Then we can consider another source, which is the emissions coming from uh, manure, slurry, depending on how this is managed uh, in grazing systems or stored in, in indoor system. And the contributions come mainly from methane and nitrous oxide. We also have emissions related to the use of energy, processing, transporting, uh, the different um, goods and and this is also happening sometimes outside the farm and then we have uh, another aspect to consider which does not does not add emissions but uh, it can subtract part of the emissions which is related to carbon sequestration mainly in in some grazing systems and some agroforestry system and there is a big debate and, and a, a big work as well on on trying to develop the best techniques possible to really quantify the amount of carbon that is uh, captured in those systems in the short and in the long term. So if we consider all these aspects, then we can conduct a, a, a common footprint analysis, uh, normally using a life cycle assessment. So we can provide the uh, figure of an amount of uh, CO2 equivalent that is produced per unit of product, in this case, kilogram of milk. But life cycle assessment, uh, and, and Simon and Agu Agustin are experts on, on that, and I'm sure they can describe this much better than me. But uh, it, it can consider different um, boxes or different um, groups of, uh, of emissions. If we focus only on the farm uh, system, uh, we can consider what we call the direct sources or so the production of feed, the animal uh, physiology and the, and the handling of manure, which contribute to these different gases. But we know that there are other sources. There are sources happening uh, outside the farm before the farm is operating in terms of uh, production of different inputs, uh, fuel, electricity, fertilizer, pesticides, or imported feed uh, and manure. So all these pre-chain sources need to be also considered. And there are other sources occurring after the product is produced related to the uh, processing and transportation or the use of different outputs uh, from the farm. So a, a complete life cycle assessment need to consider the pre-chain direct and indirect sources and, and and, um, and this is uh, sometimes uh, very challenging. When we come to the analysis of, uh, of the report of inventories per country on in terms of the emissions that come from uh, livestock production, normally they only account for this, for the direct sources. So the sources that are produced in, in the country as, uh, the, as the farms operate. 
and they do not account for the pre-chain sources and, and not uh, for the indirect sources. Normally, they, they restrict to this, which is a big chunk of the emissions, but uh, this is something to consider uh, when we are uh, evaluating the impact of animal production, uh, if we use only uh, inventories uh, from different countries or, or region. So in doing this life cycle assessment, we cannot only just say how much uh, CO2 is produced per kilogram of uh, milk, for instance, uh, but also we can allocate the, uh, the proportional importance of these uh, sources. So this is an example of uh, two very different systems, one in New Zealand grazing and another one uh, uh, indoors in, in Ohio, in, in, Ohio in, in, in the US with a very similar uh, carbon footprint, but a very different pattern of allocation. While in New Zealand, the main source is uh, animal, which is uh, enteric methane, and the emissions related to the uh, management of crop and pasture, mainly fertilizers. In the uh, indoor system, manure is not, sorry, enteric methane is not that important. And there are other sources that become very important, like um, manure storage and also uh, the ones coming from pre chain, so that different inputs that are needed mainly mainly fit. So this is uh, very useful to not only give a figure, but also identify where there is a room for intervention and where uh, we need to focus our, our effort. So how, how do we calculate these emissions uh, using life cycle assessment on any other technology? Well, uh, I'm gonna be using um, enteric methane as, as an example and the, uh, the, the framework used by the IPCC. So there are three main levels of uh, um, quantifying emissions uh, called tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is the basic one. And basically in, in, in the case of uh, enteric methane, basically uh, allocates an amount of methane uh, produced per uh, one animal. Just use the laser here. So uh, this is the, the case of uh, enteric methane for adult animals. So you basically multiply the number of animals in, in, in a farm or in a region, uh, adults or young stock, and then the equivalent um, default value is given uh, for methane without considering the productivity, the diet, etc. So it's a very basic default uh, value. We can jump and go into a, another level of complexity, which is the tier two. And basically in, in the case of methane, we need to know the gross energy intake. So the energy that animal um, uh, get from the diet and multiply that by sorry <clears throat> a emission factor which is the percentage of the gross energy that is lost uh, as, as methane and we will see later on how we calculate that every uh, category of animal or diet can have a different emission factor and the emission factor really reflects the quality of the of the diet for instance um, and we can also use country-specific uh, emission values for different livestock categories. So you can see here that we are considering not only the type of animal, but also the type of diet in, in, in this uh, production system. We can go into another level of complexity, tier three, uh, which is very rare uh, to see at the moment. And some countries have it because they have developed sophisticated uh, models in which they consider many other factors uh, specific for the countries and also, uh, include, so in, including um, uh, mitigation strategies like methane inhibitors. Normally, what we get is a, a tier two um, system with more or less uh, developed uh, factors. So you can have a tier two that is very basic, but you can have a tier two with a, a, a disaggregated emission factors for different diets, for instance, and then we can really go more into a, a better characterization of the system. We will see that later on. So uh, on the tiers, we know that um, they can be used to describe the systems. And if they are very good, so if they're more advanced, tier two or tier three, we can capture more the improvements in management and innovations. If, otherwise, if we use a very simple tier one or tier two, then we cannot uh, capture those uh, improvements. Most of the modeling tools like lifecycle assessment use tier one or tier two which were updated uh, from IPCC in 2019. The previous one were published in, in 2006, and we will see some examples uh, later on. And the importance here is that to really update those emission factors and to have a better uh, accuracy in the uh, estimation of the emissions, we need to understand the biology between, uh, behind the emission factors and measure the variations in that uh, biology. And this is what I'm going to um, 
trying to illustrate with two with two examples. I will start with the uh, one of the sources, the inputs in feed production, mainly on, on nitrous oxide. Uh, I'm not an expert on on this uh, area, and I'm sure we still know more than me about it. But just just to show uh, um, how important it is to measure and to measure well. So we know that nitrous oxide comes from uh, uh, the microbial activity in the soil after application of urea or ammonia or nitrate, and there are different reactions uh, that uh, yield more or less nitrous oxide uh, after these uh, products are applied into the into the field in the soil. We know this is a mic microbial activity uh, in, in the original 2006 IPCC uh, guidelines. Uh, there was a default value of 1% of the nitrogen applied as urea, ammonia, or nitrate is lost as nitrous oxide. But we know that this is not a fixed value. And there are many factors that influence uh, whether there is more than one or less percent uh, emitted as nitrous oxide. And that can have a huge impact in our calculations, uh, aspects like moisture, pH, temperature, carbon in soil need to be considered. So, if we measure in this case uh, with uh, in in different using different chambers uh, in different conditions, then we can really see how these factors influence uh, the emissions of nitrous oxide. So, th uh, there are uh, different works already published. Uh, this is a meta analysis published here in Spain where they analyze the impact of, uh, for instance, type of fertilizer or application rate of uh, nitrogen uh, to derive uh, an emission factor. And as you can see, in most cases, it's below the 1% uh, default value. So if you use the 1% by default, you are overestimating emissions. But with, within the or below the 1%, you need to consider different percentage of emissions depending on whether you use organic or liquid uh, uh, fertilizer or whether the application rate is... Uh, uh, less than 100 kilograms of nitrogen or more than 400. So this is very important. And now we have information about the impacts of different factors on, 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 on the percentage of uh, nitrogen that is lost as nitrous oxide. And this is what uh, uh, the new 2019 uh, guidelines have done to consider uh, different factors to disaggregate by different elements like climate, rainfall, irrigation in dry climate uh, and the fertilizer form. You can see that there are lots of studies already published and as the science progressed, then the guidelines from the official um, reports uh, can have a better uh, estimation of the, of the emissions. So this is one example. If we move to the animal physiology source, so enteric methane, and this is more uh, the area of research that uh, um, I develop in, uh, in our group. Uh, you know, the enteric methane is produced, uh, it's not produced by cows or ruminants, it's produced by um, microbial uh, microbes in the, in the rumen, uh, in particular archaea, uh, as a way of uh, getting rid of some of the hydrogen that is produced in the fermentation uh, by saturating CO2 and producing methane. So the whole uh, cycle of uh, uh, carbohydrate degradation can continue and they can obtain energy to synthesize microbial protein. If we... If we um if we could open a little hole in here in this um in this animal with a microscope uh, and we could have a look in the in the in the room and we could see something like that a very dynamic and, and diverse um, ecosystem where microbes are colonizing uh, the rumen sorry colonizing the feed material and then degrading and producing different products that the animal the animal use and some of those products is methane. So methane comes from microbial activity that has uh, different factors that make it a uh, methane production lower or, or higher. And this is what we need to consider in terms of uh, measuring. The first aspect to, to consider is the, uh, that normally the percentage of energy, of gross energy that is lost as methane, what we call the emission factor, uh, depends very much on the digestibility of the diet. So for highly digestible feeds, we have a lower emission factor. So we have a, a lower rate of um, waste of energy. And for the feeds that are not that digestible, then we had a higher um, emission factor. So we could classify feeds into low, medium, and, and high. Uh, but it's very important to see that even within each category, there are huge variations that could go, for instance, from 45 to 55 um, um, digestibility, which corresponds to different um, emission factors, uh, uh, YM. So 
different fits and different diets need to be studied uh, um, specifically to really derive uh, the emission factor from, from every diet. How do we do that? Well, we, we can do that using different tools. Uh, there are two main uh, options, and I will present quickly uh, two of them. One is the use of respirometry chambers. This is a photo of our chambers here in Granada in Spain, where we measure methane from sheep or, or goats. And it's a very simple system where essentially it's a box uh, where the animal stays for two, three days, and you have control of the air that goes in and out. And so you can measure the flow of, of air, and then you can sample that air from, from the inlet or from the outlet, and then analyze hydrogen CO2 and mainly methane to really derive how much methane is produced uh, per unit of uh, dry matter intake, given the, uh, the characteristics of the ingredients that that diet has. Um, this, how, this is considered like the gold standard uh, method, and there are plenty of uh, guidelines uh, published uh, from the Glory Search Alliance and from other works that we have conducted uh, that can people can follow uh, to measure methane from, from different feeds, different animals and different systems. The advantage of using these chambers is that we can not only derive a, a final a figure on how much methane is produced per, um, per dry matter intake, but also we can follow up during the whole day the pattern of uh, methane production. Here you have a typical graph in blue where you have like two peaks uh, of pro methane production after feeding. And then there are some other peaks as the animal keeps eating on, uh, and then it goes down. But if you apply the, an inhibitor that is included in the diet, then what you get is these uh, reductions, sharp reductions here. So you can also understand how uh, the, in the inhibition and the mitigation is, is working. Luckily, we have uh, respiratory chambers uh, all over the world. Uh, and this is just a, this is not, accurate, but it's just some, uh, an illustration of uh, where you can find chambers in different countries for the different animal species. So uh, the capacity to measure uh, methane emissions from different diets and different production systems is, is quite large. Then we have an advantage of in measuring methane production because the, the previous uh, tool chambers have some limitations that so the animal has to be enclosed in, 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 a, in a box uh, and it cannot move free like in, in a farm. But we know that nearly 100% of uh, the methane that is produced either in the rumen or in the hangar is um, expelled by the animal uh, through the mouth, either by um, um, uh, burping in, in erupts or ba basically by breathing uh, through the lungs. So if we can have access to that um, source of, of the emissions, then we can, we can measure pretty accurate how much methane is produced. Uh, and, and based on that, uh, Technology has been developed, and this is the green feed technology, where it's basically a feeder where the animal has to go and visit uh, three or four times a day minimum to get some concentrate. And then during the time the animal is eating, right, it's, it's uh, identified. And then there is like a mini chamber system where there is a uh, sucking air and then measuring the different gases. And then using very uh, accurate algorithms, now I can derive the, the 24 hours production of methane of those animals. You need a minimum of uh, visits per animal to really have an accurate estimation, but the advantage is great because you can do it in, in the farm conditions or even in grazing animals. So you can cover many different systems. As in, in chambers, we have also green feed available uh, in many parts of the world. It's amazing how many uh, have been developed and, and acquired by different research institutes or companies. Uh, mostly in, in Europe and uh, but also in the US, Canada, um, Latin America, Australia, and, and New Zealand. So how do we, after we measure methane for different diets and different type of animals, how does this translate into the IPCC guidelines? I'm going to use the uh, comparison between the original guidelines in 2006 and their um, and their update in 2019, uh, which was probably uh, yeah, two, three or four years ago. And Agustin del Prado was, for instance, involved as co-author of these uh, uh, new guidelines. So in 2006, uh, for instance, for dairy cattle or for cattle, uh, the emission factors for methane were very basic. So for feedlot uh, cattle, it was 3% of the gross energy of the diet was lost as methane. So if you knew for a tier two uh, calculation, if you knew the gross energy content of the diet, then you could derive how much methane was produced, but with no differentiation between um, between diets. And for dairy cows was the same, but applied a 6.5. Uh, 
without considering the type of forage, uh, forage concentrate ratio, etc. So it was very basic and it was the same for all the cattle that were not uh, fed uh, in feedlot. So as you can see, we have only three, two values, three and 6.5, depending on the animal category, but there was no differentiation of the system. So in 2019, for instance, for dairy cows, then we could disaggregate in, in four different uh, emission factors from 5.7 to 6.5, depending on the amount of milk produced by the animal and the digestible energy content and the content of fiber, nitrogen, uh, neutral detergent fiber, NDF. And then, so we can now see the different systems depending on the diet and the animal productivity have different uh, methane production levels. The same applies for non-dairy, uh, depending on the amount of forage and the digestibility of energy, then we can go from seven to three. So it's, it's quite, it's more than twice, uh, uh, depending on whether the animal is fed on a feedlot or is fed on, on, a, on a, a high forage uh, diet. So we can now quantify with more accuracy what happens in, the, in those systems. In pathways, we have developed new emission factors, uh, pretty much the same for dairy and, and beef cattle, but for sheep and goats that were not uh, included in 2019. And we, we hope uh, that this uh, will be considered uh, in the future uh, in, in the uh, update of the IPCC guidelines. So for instance, in, in pathways, we have defined and characterized the different EU systems, uh, livestock systems. And in that characterization, we use the diet as one of the characteristics. So now we can apply a, a specific emission factor to each of the systems. So we can reflect with more accuracy what emissions uh, this particular system uh, uses. How do we get those um, emission factors uh, from the IPCC? Well, basically, and this is just an example of a publication that we published a few years ago from the Global Research Alliance, where we collected a, a large database of uh, uh, individual measurements, mostly in, in chambers, but some of them in green feed. In total, more than 5,000 individual records, so 5,000 animals that were measured uh, for methane production in chambers uh, for different uh, kind of diets between 1962 and 2016 from different countries, as you can see here. And by doing this, uh, then you can derive different equations. Uh, I, I'm not going to go in detail here, but we can see the impact of adding different factors of the diet and see how accurate the estimation is because we have the, we can estimate, but we have the actual measurement in the chamber. So we can see whether adding uh, NDF or um, milk yield or, or total protein or fiber or body weight, then how much accurate the equation is. So when those equations are ready, then we publish them. And this is what basically is reflected in the IPCC guidelines that you can that you can see here. Obviously much more simplified, uh, but basically it comes from this kind of study. So from chambers and green feed into models derived in publications, and then those are analyzed. Uh, uh, and then a table like this is, is developed. I know it sounds very simple, but I'm sure Agustin can provide detail on how um, complex it is to consider all of that and how to get rid of data that are not uh, consistent, et cetera. But this is pretty much the sequence. Right, so by doing that, then, as I said before, we can not only just uh, allocate a, a figure of a carbon footprint using LCA, but also uh, see how much improvement we can get in different, in different um, parts of the production chain. So for instance, if we use nutritional additives to reduce and take methane, then we can calculate if we have uh, the right emission factor and the right uh, formula, we can really see whether there is a reduction on, on methane production. If we were using the tier one default value, which gives you amount of methane produced by animal, but nothing else, then we cannot account for this uh, aspect. And this is something that is becoming very relevant in the, in, in the market. Another example would be the use of byproducts. If we use byproducts to replace some alternative feeds, then we will be using less uh, uh, fertilizers, for instance, and then we could potentially reduce the amount of methane that comes from, uh, from the pre-change, from the different inputs. Or if we increase the longevity, then we can dilute the uh, methane produced, for instance, uh, during the uh, growth of the animal when it's young. Uh, and then uh, basically the total uh, carbon footprint would be uh, diluted in terms of uh, energy corrected milk. So this value could be much lower, but we need to have those data and the formulas. Otherwise we cannot account for these improvements, which is 
part of the work that we do in, in Pathways. So this is a sample uh, before I finish uh, that provided by Simon uh, in uh, in Southwest UK on, on beef production, 30 cycle cow reared uh, finished at 625 kilograms. And, and, and he used a tier two enteric methane and manure equations from, uh, from IPCC, so from the 2019 updated uh, guidelines. Uh, and basically what they could uh, see is that there are two major largest impacts. One is on enteric methane, and then the production of forages, mainly from uh, fertilizers, production of seeds and, and fuel. So, and this is what you get. You get a, a very clear um, allocation of the different sources where you can see the enteric methane is uh, probably 40% and, and, the, um, and the emissions coming from the production of forages is another 35, 40%. Uh, so in these systems, if you want to really reduce emissions, you need to focus on, on one of these two because uh, the, the impact on the total carbon footprint would be much larger than we if we concentrate, for instance, on how to handle uh, manure uh, in, in these systems. So this is the, uh, the beauty of uh, using a, an accurate a tool that can account for uh, the different sources of, of emissions. So just to finish, uh, before we go into uh, uh, discussions, uh, um, we've seen that um, the total livestock greenhouse gases, gases uh, estimation includes uh, both animal and system emissions consideration. So we need to consider both aspects. It would really have to have a, a good picture of, of the system. Uh, direct emissions we know come from the type of animal and, and, and the diet. And then the systems emission come from uh, the different uh, sources of forages, concentrate, transportation, fertilization, etc. Obviously, the emissions per animal or kilogram of product um, will depend on many factors that, that we need to consider. And this is where we can see any if any improvement can reduce uh, the environmental impact of, uh, of um, livestock production. And as I was saying before, uh, there are different metrics to, and I'm, and I'm not going to discuss into this, but uh, uh, maybe we can go into the discussion later on that. The, the main of the, the standard uh, unit to uh, reflect the carbon footprint is the, the, the one kilogram of products, either milk uh, or, or meat. But there are many other metrics that can be considered, and it's interesting to consider them. And I was talking before about the uh, GWP star, but also you, we can also reflect not only per kilogram of product, but also per kilogram of um, protein or digestible protein or essential amino acids, which can put the value of animal products in a different perspective. Because if we compare one kilogram of uh, broccoli with one kilogram of beef meat, yeah, we are comparing kilograms, but you're comparing kilograms that have a very, very different composition in terms of uh, nutrients. And this is something that we, we will also work in pathways to really have a, a fair comparison of uh, animal products with other products. So to really have a good estimation using these uh, modeling tools, we need to consider the biological factors that determine emissions. And I use two examples of uh, from nitrous oxide or enteric methane. So we need to measure, well, uh, according to the factor that we are considering. So the formulas and the models that we develop uh, improve. So we can better describe the systems, uh, but we can also capture the improvements in management or the application of different innovations. And with that said, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will stop sharing. I'll stop here and uh, yeah, be happy to hear from Agustin, of course, and from any of you as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I will just introduce you. So <laughs> thank you very much, David, and Agustin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. I mean, uh, you have provided a very comprehensive. Uh, uh, introduction of, of some of the basics and, and already introduced some of the challenges. Of course, my, my duty here is uh, trying to, to, to be like an oracle, I, I suppose, and, 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 and you know, and give the 
uh, the holy grail of, of the challenges around uh, this topic. Uh, obviously, I don't have a lot of time and, uh, and uh, I tend to actually stay longer than I am required in some occasions. So I don't have a presentations. I, I, I just uh, was going to, to speak about uh, to kind of react about uh, David's presentation. I already talked about uh, uh, talk with him previously, so I knew what he was going to talk. So it's not like a like a genuinely uh, like a suddenly a reaction. But uh, I mean, it's very clear like uh, what you've been uh, presenting that, uh, well, we have to put in, in, in value that uh, there's been a, a fast and clear improvement on methodologies, uh, on on measurements, uh, techniques for greenhouse gas emissions. You've talked about uh, specifically uh, more on, on enteric methane. So they are faster, uh, these uh, techniques. They are more reliable and uh, and they are either cheaper than in the past or or is easier to be uh, funded, I, I suppose, because there are more and more groups that can access them. And, and this is a, a very good news. Uh, we don't know if this is as fast as we, we need, but very good news. Uh, in respect with modeling, uh, obviously, greenhouse gas uh, modeling for livestock has also been improved. And we have to always uh, remember that these are not uh, uh, two different areas like uh, that are working in isolation. I mean, we always tend to to, to say uh, from the modeling perspective, when, when there is someone like saying, oh, we need more measurements and not modeling. Well, I mean, uh, or they say models are very bad. Well, models are uh, at least as good as the data they are based on. And uh, I mean, if we improve the, the data from the measurements, we can uh, improve the, the, the theories that are behind the, the models. So in that respect, things have improved as well. And I'm very happy as well that uh, moreover, uh, there have been more uh, uh, holistic the, the, the methodologies and the, there is a lot of uh, people trying to to model not just uh, the animal level but going at the system level which is uh, very important I mean this maybe 20 years ago there there were very few people that uh, that uh, that were doing that and I think there are now a lot of more uh, people and a lot of projects that are trying to do that uh, the use of life cycle analysis as well on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture as well has uh, rocketed in the last 10 years. And this is good news as well. I mean, the one of the examples that you provided uh, here, just as a reaction, and I didn't know you were going to use a, an example from a place that I've been working in, in Rothamsted in, uh, from a, a colleague, Graham uh, McAlofi and, and collaborators. And, and this is actually a very nice uh, example of how we can uh, apply uh, measurements and modeling uh, in in one study because I don't know if you mentioned but a lot of the there were some uh, some of the emissions that the, they estimate are done through modeling like uh, enteric methane but a lot of other emissions uh, at the farm level have been actually measured there which uh, okay this is like a golden standard of uh, quantification trying to use as much as possible measurements and uh, fewer and fewer uh, uh, models, but obviously this is golden standard and there are not many places I think that they can do that to really uh, fine tune the, the, the quantification. I mean, in terms of challenges, uh, I mean, I obviously have a lot in, in mind, it's my field topic for a lot of time, but I mean, I will focus on one specific one that probably you haven't, you have touched uh, superficially, but I think I, I would want to maybe go a little bit deeper. In particular, the challenge that I think we have for measuring and modeling uh, low input systems uh, in li livestock systems in terms of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, most of the times, this, this will be under grazing uh, conditions. Uh, the first inherent challenge that we have with low input uh, systems is that very heterogeneous in terms of management, in terms of uh, sites, in terms of uh, well, in terms of uh, a lot of things, soils, breed, animal breeds, etc. So this is generally very difficult. Maybe not not so much to quantify a specific uh, conditions, but to generalize this into uh, something more of a modeling uh, exercise is, is more difficult. Uh, for example, just thinking about the mission factors that uh, David has uh, has given us a, a very good uh, a, a very good examples from methane or N2O. Most of the experiments that are derived uh, from uh, historically from 
for for this livestock systems derived from uh, industrialized areas. Even if we talk about uh, grazing systems, we generally use uh, a lot of the data from New Zealand, which is a, a developed area, or even from the UK or or other places. So obviously, uh, these areas that don't face uh, the same uh, challenges. Uh, and the same heterogeneity conditions that we could have in other non-industrialized areas, like could be lack of feed, uh, lack of water, uh, limitations uh, in energy use. Uh, well, obviously the breeds are completely different in some cases. So there is still a challenge really to reconcile that, uh, especially when we go and we provide a quantification at the global scale. And uh, I mean, probably not that, re that so relevant this is what i'm saying or as relevant at the european level but when we go at the global scale we have to uh, consider that most of the greenhouse gas emissions or at least most of the methane from enteric fermentation will come possibly from a uh, low input system so at least non-industrialized uh, systems so we need to look at that okay so uh, I mean, it's, it's been already mentioned by david i mean the golden standard for enteric methane are generally considered for entering methane uh, quantification, the, the chambers, the respirometric chambers, and the, uh, and the green feed, for example. And, and these are generally very difficult uh, to be used in, in some cases, impossible to use for grazing systems or low input uh, systems. So then uh, people try to use in those systems other type of techniques. And uh, well, are we sure about the, the absolute numbers that come out of there? Uh, how I know there is some progress, but uh, I mean, I think there's still uh, challenges around that and uh, to fine tuning how much emissions are derived there. Are. And moreover, for modeling as well, with uh, David already mentioned, one of the general ways to do the entering methane modeling is uh, first estimating how much the animal uh, eats. And this is still a big challenge, I would say, for grazing conditions. And again, uh, specifically speaking for more low input conditions. And if we don't know what they eat, it's impossible to know how much they emit. What they eat and what type of feed they eat, they, what uh, what is what characteristics they have in the different uh, times of the year, etc. For N2O as well, uh, soil N2O, they, they, uh, David mentioned, uh, the IPC 2019 made good progress to trying to uh, uh, to try to disaggregate emission factors uh, depending on whether these nitrogen inputs come from the animal, uh, whether these nitrogen inputs to the soil uh, uh, come from dry or from uh, come sorry in dry or 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 wet uh, agroclimatic areas. So you would have different uh, different emission factors. But still, there is missing, and this is very connected to low input system systems. One thing that already also David mentioned in one of his. Uh, in one in one of his studies that he he mentioned about N2O, uh, science now suggests a lot of uh, the data suggests that the, there is a non-linearity for N2O between the nitrogen input that goes into the soil and the N2O that is emitted. So okay, we accept and even the IPC 2009. Uh, phrases that, but admits that uh, we don't have emission factors to actually represent this non-linearity, generally actually meaning that, that is uh, more uh, close to a, to an emission factor that, that could be more of a, a, a over on an um, exponential fashion. So meaning that uh, if you have very intensive systems uh, where there is high inputs of nitrogen per hectare, the emission factor would be much higher. So the percentage of nitrogen that is emitted as N2O would be much higher than in an N2O emission that uh, is in a, in a in an extensive system. So it's a non-linear really emission factor that cannot be reflected, reflected so far, but we need to work on that. And there are other many different aspects that are intimately related to grazing systems and low input that are more difficult to quantify as well. David uh, mentioned a little bit the, the challenge to quantify soil organic uh, uh, carbon or even carbon that, that, can say that is stored in uh, agroforestry systems linked with livestock. So, okay, we are improving, but still we are quite far to have uh, certain uh, estimations. And obviously for low input systems, this may be a, a good, uh, well, a, a portion of uh, emissions that can be offset by this organic carbon or carbon uh, sequestration. 
typically as well we could think of other and, and this is just to finish like other more more challenging aspects for low input systems which could be to represent the role of uh, of low input systems in preventing fires in some uh, occasions in uh, livestock systems linked to to forestry areas or even more prospective and and i have to say because this is something that we are working now from the bc3 and it's a, i know it's a prospective and sometimes provocative and I'm thinking about that because considering the reaction that some people are are having on on some of our uh, uh, publications, and is estimating how much uh, how many of the greenhouse gas emissions that are actually allocated to grazing system low input systems that actually are replacing uh, emissions from uh, from uh, ancient uh, herbivores in this land that were grazing in the past. Uh, so therefore, these emissions we are considering or we are introducing that could be maybe uh, not accounted, should be accounted as anthropogenic. And with this, I just wanted to to end and uh, and just uh, hope this is a good fit for, for more questions and reflections and, and considerations. And, and uh, well, to finish, just many thanks for inviting me and having here. I think it's going to be a, a wonderful and very interesting project. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Agustin. Uh, and also thanks again, David. Um, so now we will take questions. Um, so because we have still a lot of participants, please uh, ask your question on the chat. Uh, and uh, I will uh, read them uh, in in order. But uh, don't hesitate to ask a question on the chat. Uh, so we have a first question. Um, so by Maria. Uh, Augustine has already touched on this, but please can you explain where the carbon and metal life cycles are considered in the model presented by David? For example, for 100% pasture feed beef dairy and dairy, where are the positive effects of soil carbon sequestration and the relationship between biogenic methane and methanotrops taken into consideration? This is the first question. And also, David, can you elaborate what would be the outcome if we use DWP uh, stars? Yeah, I can I can start, and I'm sure Agustin can um, add more on, on that. Yeah, it, what I presented is how to measure methane um, on um, as an example of uh, one of the sources of emissions. But we know that there are many other sources, but also uh important things i think uh we're still lacking of a good methodology to really um account accurately for for the effect of those things in terms of uh, carbon sequestration and this is something that uh we need to uh, make more progress uh, for extensive systems and different grazing or agroforestry um, we are working on specifically in, in pathways in different environments. And one of the environments here in, in, in Spain, grazing systems is the DESA in, in the Southwest. And it's very challenging to, to derive an accurate value of how much carbon is uh, captured uh, over uh, a short or long period of time. So this is something we're still lacking. Uh, and, and of course, it will improve the, the, the estimation of the impact of uh, or could lower the impact of the, some of the systems for sure. Um, it, it's much easier to measure methane that comes from an animal in a closed environment, the, the carbon that uh, is um, captured in the soil by trees, grass, uh, etc. cetera, um, because by nature it's, it's a very, it's much more complex um, process. In relation to the GWP star, um, I'm not an expert on that, but basically the standard G uh, GWP 100 um, assumes that um, but it gives a, a, a global warming potential but assumes that the gases are there uh, and it does not account for uh, the lifespan of these gases and we know that methane has a much shorter uh, lifespan so if we predict a global warming potential on different times then that needs to be considered and, and the whole the whole thing becomes more um more complex, but we know that comparing GWP 100 with GWP star, uh, maybe the, the 100 is overestimating the impact of methane by three or four times, but depends on the situation. 
So for instance, if uh, if the emissions uh, from using of fossil fuels or increasing livestock increase, then the warming potential of the global warming will increase. But if uh, if we maintain constant uh, the emissions of let, let's say methane, or if we lower the, the emissions of methane, then the impact is much more different. And, and, in, and in fact, it could have a reduction effect of, of global warming. This is in very simple terms. Uh, I know that there are graphs that can illustrate the differences between using one or the other, and there are big debates uh, at the moment. At the moment, IPCC is not, as far as I know, does not use um, GWP star, uh, but I know that there are, there are um, big discussions uh, about that, and, and it's something that both the scientific community and the regulators need to uh, need to consider. But I'm sure Agustin has more input to give on, on this subject. Okay, thanks, David. Um, we also have a question from Diana. Um, Diana, if you prefer, you can uh, you can ask yourself you, yourself your question. Put your camera, or I can make. Oh, as you sorry, want. my my camera is not working, but I, I can just ask from a curiosity perspective. I know that there are also. It's not my area of research, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> and there are some uh, specific masks that have been developed for grazing animals. Um, and I was just thinking about the feeding, the natural feeding behavior of of, uh, of cattle, for instance, and pasture, how, how, how that is uh, nowadays, like if it's used, if it's not, because David mentioned um, the, the, the chambers. How is your view of what is the state of art in that? Uh, thank you, Diana. I'm not sure what masks you refer to. So masks to measure methane or masks yes, to yes, capture masks methane? To, masks to measure the, the methane, not yeah. to, to mitigate. Well, the, the ones that use um, SF6, uh, the, they don't include a mask. Others that include a mask... Uh, yeah, they have an impact on natural behavior because the animal has a, a device uh, in in the head that um, may impact um, the natural behavior and therefore the grazing uh, behavior. And, and as Augustine said, um, estimating or measuring uh, dramatic intake in, in grazing animals is a big challenge. So if, if we affect that, then the whole thing is, is not very accurate. Uh, to be honest, I think uh, um, at the moment for grazing animals, the best um, the best system to um, to quantify methane emissions is still green feed, um, and um, and there are several works uh, showing that. But we still face the challenge of knowing how much grass the animal is eating, uh, which the green feed doesn't solve because the green feed is designed to just to measure methane. So. Yeah, masks, I don't think it's a solution, uh, as, as far as I know, for the technology we have now. Um, but we still have challenges around uh, dog systems, as Agustin uh, pointed out before. Thank you. Lawrence, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, hi. Yeah, thanks, Amandine. Thanks, David. And I guess it's really interesting talks. So I just had a question for David about the, it's related to Diana's question about accuracy, actually, because I get the impression with the chamber experiments, it's, there's potential stress being caused to the animal in that environment. I mean, it's a, it's a very kind of false environment, obviously, putting an animal in a chamber. I just wondered if anybody had looked into that, if you'd seen any work around how, um, accurate the chamber method is the methane recording of ruminants in particular and whether there's been any work to see how that compares to um, chambers versus SF6 versus green feed for example uh, like comparing all three I know you mentioned the green feed in your view is the sort of best or approach and does that come into it in terms of having it's a more sort of natural approach to measuring methane just wondered if you could comment on that aspect of the using the use of chambers and the potential um, accuracy of the measurement. 
Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, for sure, animals, when you, any intervention that you do on animals uh, have an impact on the behavior and, and potentially stress. And, and in this case, the major um, impact is on, on intake because uh, we are measuring something that depends on how much substrate goes into the rumen of the animals. There are protocols in place and we follow them here and, and in many other places where uh, you need to know how much uh, the animal is having uh, is eating before going to the chamber. So you can see whether uh, when, when the animal goes into the chamber, you have a big drop in, in raw matter intake and therefore consider those data um, good or not. So we have a threshold of 20, 10, 20% maximum. Then if the animal is going be, uh, above that, then these uh, data are not good enough. Uh, but that can be solved by um, training animals. So, so we have animals that are trained to go regularly into the chamber. So they familiarize with the environment. Uh, they normally go in groups. So they have one chamber next to another in our case, and they can see each other. They can hear each other uh, to minimize those uh, those stress. Um, still, the chamber is, is the, it's, it's called the gold standard because clearly it's, the, it's what really measures with more accuracy how much methane is coming from the animal. But you need to make sure that, yeah, as you said, the animal is in the in the best possible conditions to reflect what's happening in, in the system. SF6, uh, it's, it was a good system uh, many years ago, but uh, we know that it's not very accurate. It's not as accurate as green feet, uh, for instance. It's good for comparisons. It's very good because the animal is free grazing and it's, that's great, but it relies on many other technical aspects uh, measuring the SF6 in, in, the, in, in the container where the gas is uh, accumulated and the, the release of the gas in the, in the valve or in the bolus that is included in the room and changes. So there are many aspects that make it very less accurate. And, and that's why clearly green feed is, um, is becoming so popular and and it's been used worldwide. Yeah, thanks. Do you have other questions? Well, I can see that Agustin has already uh, included uh, quite a lot of uh, information on GWP star, um, which uh, is not easy to explain in, in 10 or five minutes. Uh, but yeah, I, I, think it's a, it's, I think it's an important issue. Uh, I can also say that um, we need to make sure that we, yeah, of course, we measure well, we measure in realistic conditions, then we can translate that into good models, and then we use the best metrics possible. And this GWP star system is is is, is one example. But we need also to make sure that uh, those metrics are not used in your own interest. So, um, so livestock is not accused of, uh, or companies uh, or the sector is not accused of uh, greenwashing basically by using one metric or the other. So I think it's important to be honest. And, and, and then when there is no clear evidence or uncertainty of um, using one or the other, um, I think it's, uh, it's important to say that because uh, there are so many things that are not clear, as I was then said. So um, um, yeah, it's good to improve, but, but um, we can say now things that we couldn't 10 years ago in terms of uh, methane production in different systems because we have the technology, but we still have lots to, to improve. Okay, thanks for this compliment. Um, does anyone has a question? Is there something that uh, you it's not clear or... Oh, Diana, you have no question? Yeah, I can, I can say it. <laughs> I just wanted, David, if you could just, um, in few words, if you could elaborate, like how can pathways contribute to this, uh, to the events of this research topic and what? how can we go forward? Yeah, in, in very, very briefly, um, Pathways, I think, not only will contribute, is contributing to first better characterize the systems, so to have a better definition of the different systems that we have uh, across Europe uh, in terms of uh, the management, so we can really analyze them separately and we can see the pros and cons of uh, some of them, and in particular for the um, for the missions, uh, developing 
uh, more accurate emission factors that can be linked to specificities of each system will help us to quantify uh, with more accuracy the, the emissions coming from different systems if we change things. So now that we have around 30 systems, we can have emission factors uh, specific for them. And then if they're in a living lab or in any experiment or any study, uh, a technology is in included, then with those new emission factors, hopefully we can have a, a good estimation of what is the impact of applying that technology. While before in some of the systems, uh, because we use default values, uh, the calculation would be exactly the same because we go and go as steep in the calculations as we can now. So that, in my opinion, is the contribution that we can uh, go, uh, we can do from, from Pathways. Of course, in collaboration with many other researchers and organization outside Pathways, because this is a, yeah, a very complex uh, issue. Okay, thanks for this conclusion, David. Um, so I don't see other questions in the chat. I don't see hands raised. So thanks a lot uh, for your participation.